update module is to speak to the question of reactor safety and issues around that. And I don't have as many graphic pictures, and that's just about the way you would like it uh, anyway. Uh, let, me, let me try and deconstruct the scenario and, and, and provide you with some insights as to, as to where we're at and where, how this thing will unfold, particularly with respect to the new nuclear reactors at the Fukushima. Uh, these are units 1, 2, and 3, and unit 4, uh, uh, with related to its spent fuel base. Uh, I would summarize and say that at best we can describe this situation as serious, perhaps very serious. It is evolving, it has not ended yet, uh, but it's relatively clear that this is not going to be a catastrophic event. Uh, so you might say, well, what's the difference uh, between serious and a catastrophic event? Uh, there is uh, the international uh, nuclear event scale which I put up here for you, uh, and not to spend a lot of time trying to go through what is classified as what under each one of them, but what is a major accident that is a catastrophic event in this scheme is the equivalent of Chernobyl, where you have complete, uncontrolled, massive, absolute amounts of huge quantities of radioactivity released into the environment with very significant potential for uh, impacts on the environment and health effects. So that is a major accident. And in that respect, this thing falls somewhere between four and five. Uh, what, as I say, it's evolving. Uh, it will require some planned uh, countermeasures with respect to the radioactivity that has been released and that may well be released still further. Uh, and therefore, an enormous effort around monitoring and so on will be part of, of, of this event. Let me now turn to the essential of what I call the nuclear reactor safety uh, issues and calibrate for you where we're at. I have actually a prop and a picture. And uh, the prop is this. Uh, with apologies to uh, Bob McDonald on the Quirks and Quarks. Uh, he was explaining to Peter Mansbridge uh, the concept of the reactor and so on, and I thought it was quite nice, so I'll give it a try here. And it's uh, complete plagiarism as it were. So this is the fuel assembly that is inside a nuclear reactor. Okay, so this is the uranium fuel, and it does look like that, and it's both. This is the reactor pressure vessel. This is my hip steel uh, water bottle. And of course, there's water in there, which is when the reactor is operating, boils, creates the steam, creates the power, and this is all sealed up. Uh, so that forms the containment. That's the first bit of that pressure vessel. That's what you've got. And there's the potential to be able to release pressure from time to time. So that's the essence of, of the. Uh, the this is not original, but uh, I saw it on CBC and I said, uh, <laughs> Let me give you a sense of the amount of energy in an operating power reactor. A thousand megawatt electric capacity power reactor uh, has actually 3,000 megawatts of thermal energy in it. Now, this might not mean much to you at all, uh, but if I were to decipher that, that is the equivalent of 10,000 of your high end BMWs at full throttle rattling about in a volume. Uh, in the order of 100 plus uh, cubic meters. So the energy density and the flux and the amount of power in this, in this pressure vessels is actually enormous. That's just the only simple thing to remember. We won't go to numbers anymore. So when the earthquake hit and the tsunami followed, uh, what, what happened? The reactor shut down. It was good design. And there was uh, in fact, no structural damage to the reactors, uh, both as part of the earthquake event and the force of the magnitude of that earthquake event, and for that matter, the tsunami that followed. Would you prefer? Yeah. At home, I'm always told that I speak very too much. <laughs> <laughs> so, as long as you can hear me back there. So, the reactor shut down. And, uh, what happened though, and, 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 and there are three critical functions when it comes to reactor safety. The ability to shut down, 
to cool and to contain. The only thing you need to remember. In Chernobyl, in fact, it was an absolute runaway. 80 times the full power, it was a reactivity induced accident that blew a thousand ton slab on top of the reactor and, and it did not shut down, could not. It was a reactivity induced event that the reactor did not shut down. That was the enormous amount of energy that, that was released. You don't have that situation here at all, okay? Given that there is still that equivalent of 10,000 BMWs rattling here, that reactor shut down, the power, the, the thermal energy drops dramatically in the first second down to 7% and within a day down to where we are, uh, about 0.5% of the energy that continue to, that is still in the order of 20 megawatts thermal energy that continues to be generated in this reactor. And hence, therefore, the need and the requirement to continue to cool it and to ensure that containment integrity remains in place, uh, otherwise you've got problems. So the subsequent problems that we've had at uh, Fukushima, and I'll, I'll trace the sequence for you in a moment, uh, is related to those two essential functions and the fact that now you've lost power to off, uh, backup power and off-site power, so you've got complete darkness, no lights in the, in the control room, no ability to know what's going on. So the reactor is in a, in a, in a self-circulating uh, mode here, and all manner of issues emerge as a result of that, okay? So, in that first, day, half day, they knew they had a serious situation on their hand because there was no power, no backup. But if you understand <coughs> reactor safety, there are these two issues that you still need to tackle. And that's the question, how are you going to cool these reactors? And are you, do you have some assurance of the containment integrity? So from March the 11th to the 22nd, uh, in fact, you had no power. So all these images that you have seen you know, helicopters dropping water and fire trucks and in the, 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 it is in lieu of, it is this concern around uh, being able to keep these reactors cool and to ensure containment integrity and, and have some sense, because you're not in being able to monitor, so all the monitoring is external and so on. In that process, uh, what we've had is, uh, let, let me, uh, tell you the next next sequence in a moment, but uh, a bit of big good news as of two o'clock this afternoon, uh, at Vienna time anyway, that uh, power has been restored to all the units in the in the reactors. Uh, lights are on in the control room, uh, and the, the the function of injecting uh, uh, coolant into the reactor and not seawater now, but uh, clean water into the system is underway and you're on the path to stabilization of this reactor, at least from the reactor safety perspective, okay? So while the, 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 the ability to cool the reactor was compromised in that March 11th to 22nd, it took that 10 days to, to, to get there, what happened? The, the length of the fuel assemblies, these pencils that I showed you, were uncovered because there was oil of water inside the reactor. And uh, what that does is it causes damage to the fuel. Fuel overheats and you, you get damage to the fuel assemblies. And in fact, that is where the release of the fission products such as iodine-121 and cesium-131. Uh, so you might answer to your question, if the reactor shut down, where is this radioactivity coming from? It is in the second phase of the accident, if you wish, for the uh, evolution of the event that you are uncovering the fuel, there is core damage, there is damage inside the reactor pressure vessel assembly, uh, and it is release of not only iodine and, and uh, cesium, but formation of hydrogen. There is a zircaloid steam reaction that produces the hydrogen, and that hydrogen, when it appeared into the reactor uh, buildings, are the result of what caused the explosions uh, that you saw in that time from the second day and, uh, in between and so on. So, so you have a situation where there is fuel damage, there's damage in the core, and, and that is the source of the radioactivity 
that we have seen released uh, uh, at, uh, out of these plants. And if you have questions, we'll discuss this uh, uh, a bit further. Then there is one other aspect which is, uh, has been a difficult one here for, for the Japanese. And at one point you might ask, uh, who decided to put the spent fuel bays up on the top of the reactor? Because you've seen pictures of their attempt, to, heroic attempt to try and pull the fuel bays. Now, the fuel bays are kind of a different story from the well-contained reactor inside the primary containment vessel and secondary containment vessels and so on. They are outside in the reactor building uh, at room temperature, just like a fuel, like a big fueling pool. Uh, and uh, you've got the fuel that has come out from the reactors. They still have a reasonable amount of heat in them, so you need to, there are two key functions. The water provides shielding, which is the direct radiation that would emerge from this fuel if you uncovered the water. And of course, it requires cooling to ensure that. that the, the, but the, the demand on that cooling is less in, in, in the redex meters of uh, water on top of the, of the fuel base, and the heat generated is less, and so on. But you still need to keep it clean because, and we've seen temperature profiles of each of these fuel bays over time, and were, some of them were uncovered at some point. And that's where you've had some explosions occur within the fuel base, which then forms also a basis for release of radioactivity into the environment. So, so it is a serious concern. But they put the fuel base way up because partly to address the question of the scenario. Right? Just one of those things that, that uh, uh, but the fuel and the cooling of the fuel base uh, has been a parallel issue uh, and a challenge in terms of uh, being able to control the, the uh, Paul, I'm coming to my uh, end. I don't have any more slides than this, so rest the uh, So I think I'll explain, in essence, the, 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 the key aspects here. I can find where to move to the next slide. And you have seen quite a lot of newspaper reports, and so have I in the last uh, 12, uh, 10 or 12 days. And any time I read, uh, it is feared that, or the fear is, and the, we have con concern over something, I throw that in the garbage and I go straight to the IAEA website or the number of other websites that actually provide you with, with enormous amount of good technical data that if you, if you can learn how to decipher what some of this means, like what's the reactor outlet header pressure doing, or what's the temperature in the fuel bay, or what's the pressure here, that gives you a very clear indication of uh, whether that report on that newspaper was just just blowing on to, to, to create a kind of a situation that... that uh, so this is the kind of uh, uh, technical information and data that you need to monitor. I've got one more slide, which, uh, not that you can, you can read it, but this gives you, this gives you a, a perspective that you need to get into this level of detail to kind of decipher to say, is this green, red, or, 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 or yellow as an area of concern. And there's only one other last point I will leave, uh, leave you with, is this. I have followed the sequence hour by hour, minute by minute, from the time the earthquake, uh, to the extent that they've been published and it's out there, uh, and uh, have been particularly annoyed at, at none other than the, the head of the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission, who, should I say, Mark Dope, I guess, was, was uh, made some very dramatic statements about the way the Japanese were handling things, and this and that. And, and, uh, if you look at that sequence and the, the degree of professionalism and the credibility with which they have proceeded to, to address the, the, the difficult situation they found themselves in, uh, and I would ask, and so what is it that you think we would have done any differently if we had been faced with that? So do not second guess and, 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 and make unnecessarily uh, comments about the way the Japanese have handled the situation. When the sequences get properly written up and, and there are a lot of what lessons have been learned out of this images, and there will be lessons learned and there will have been uh, aspects where you say something could have been done better or why, why not and, and so on. But that all will come out in the fullness of the full assessment of the accident and the, the, the situation and so on. Do not underestimate that they are doing anything that is, that is either not in line with these are people, and the Japanese engineering and earthquake design uh, is the leading edge in the world. That's where we've all learned how to actually design our power plants, and they are a serious 
contributor to both the science and technology and development in that area, uh, this is an event that has overwhelmed uh, even anything that anyone could have predicted. So in conclusion then, uh, the reason why uh, we can say that this is serious, uh, but not catastrophic, I think it's self-evident. I explained to you this was not a reactor at power that blew up. Reactor at power all shut down nicely. There were subsequent events that are still important to reactor safety, which if you can't manage, and they couldn't manage because there was no power, uh, has resulted in, and, and you see in these pictures, the red fuel, there is poor damage, there is clear understanding that fuel has been damaged, that's when radioactivity has been released, that's got to be monitored, and it's not as high level as, as a lot of the reports uh, tend to suggest. We can discuss that a bit further if you want. And that's my point. Thank you.